This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two The Education of a Personage. Chapter One The Debutante. Part Three. Five weeks later. Again, the library of the Conant's house. Rosalind is alone, sitting on the lounge, staring very moodily and unhappily at nothing. She has changed perceptibly. She is a threefold thinner for one thing. The light in her eyes is not so bright. She looks easily a year older. Her mother comes in, muffled in an opera cloak. She takes in Rosalind with a nervous glance. Who is coming tonight? Rosalind fails to hear her, at least takes no notice. Alec is coming up to take me to this berry play, et tu Brutus. She perceives that she is talking to herself. Rosalind, I asked you, who is coming tonight? Oh, what? Oh, Amory. You have so many admirers lately that I couldn't imagine which one. Dawson Ryder is more patient than I thought he'd be. You haven't given him an evening this week. Mother, please. Oh, I won't interfere. You've already wasted over two months on a theoretical genius who hasn't a penny to his name, but go ahead, waste your life on him. I won't interfere. You know he has a little income, and you know he's earning thirty-five dollars a week in advertising. And it wouldn't buy your clothes. I have your best interests at heart. When I tell you not to take a step, you'll spend your days regretting. It's not as if your father could help you. Things have been hard for him lately, and he's an old man. You'd be dependent absolutely on a dreamer. A nice, well-born boy, but a dreamer merely clever. For heaven's sakes, mother. A maid appears, announces Mr. Blaine, who follows immediately. Amory's friends have been telling him for ten days that he looks like the wrath of God, and he does. As a matter of fact, he has not been able to eat the mouthful in the legs thirty-six hours. Good evening, Mrs. Connage. Good night, Amory. Amory and Rosalind exchange glances, and Alec comes in. Alec's attitude throughout has been neutral. He believes in his heart that marriage would make Amory mediocre and Rosalind miserable, but he feels a great sympathy for both of them. Hi, Amory. Hi, Alec. Tom said he'd meet you at the theatre. Yeah, just saw him. How's the advertising today? Write some brilliant copy? Oh, it's about the same. I got a raise of two dollars a week come alec i hear the car a good night rather chilly in sections after mrs Connors and alec go out there is a pause rosalind still stares moodily at the fireplace amory goes to her and puts his arms around her darling girl they kiss another pause and then she seizes his hand covers it with kisses and holds it to her breast I love your hands more than anything. I see them often when you're away from me. So tired. I know every line of them. Dear hands. Their eyes meet for a second, and then she begins to cry. A cheerless sobbing. Rosalind. Oh, we're so darned pitiful. Rosalind. Oh, I want to die. Rosalind, another night of this, and I'll go to pieces. You've been this way four days now. You've got to be more encouraging, or I can't work, or eat, or sleep. We'll have to make a start. I like having to make a start together. What's the matter? It's Dawson Ryder. That's what it is. He's been working on your nerves. You've been with him every afternoon for a week. People come and tell me they've seen you together, and I have to smile and nod and pretend it hasn't the slightest significance for me. And you won't tell me anything as it develops. Amory, if you don't sit down now, I'll scream. Oh, Lord. You know I love you, don't you? Yes. You know I'll always love you. Don't talk that way. You frighten me. It sounds as if we weren't going to have each other. I felt all afternoon that things were worse. I nearly went wild at the office. Couldn't write a line. Tell me everything. There's nothing to tell, I say. I'm just nervous. Rosalind. You're playing with the idea of marrying Dawson Ryder. 
He's been asking me to all day. Well, he's got his nerve. I like him. Don't say that. It hurts me. Don't be a silly idiot. You know you're the only man I've ever loved, ever will love. Rosalind, let's get married. Next week. We can't. Why not? Oh, we can't. I'd be your squaw in some horrible place. We'll have two hundred and seventy-five dollars a month, all told. Darling, I don't even do my own hair usually. I'll do it for you. <laughs> Thanks. Rosalind, you can't be thinking of marrying someone else. Tell me. You leave me in the dark. I can help you fight it out if you'll only tell me. It's just us. We're pitiful, that's all. The very qualities I love you for are the ones that will make you a failure. Go on. Oh, it is Dawson Ryder. He's so reliable, I almost feel that he'd be a, a background. You don't love him. I know, but I respect him, and he's a good man and a strong one. Yes, he's that. Well, here's one little thing. There was a little poor boy we met in Rye Tuesday afternoon, and, oh, Dawson took him on his lap and talked to him and promised him an Indian suit, and next day he remembered and bought it, and, oh, it was so sweet, and I couldn't help thinking he'd be so nice to, to our children, take care of them, and I wouldn't have to worry. Rosalind, Rosalind. Don't look so consciously suffering. What power we have hurting each other. It's been so perfect, you and I. So like a dream that I'd long for and never thought I'd find. The first real unselfishness I've ever felt in my life. And I can't see it fade out in a colorless atmosphere. It won't. It won't. I'd rather keep it as a beautiful memory, tucked away in my heart. Yes, women can do that but not men. I'd remember always not the beauty of it while it lasted, but just the bitterness, the long bitterness. Don't. All the years never to see you, never to kiss you, just a gate shut and barred. You don't dare be my wife. No, no, I'm taking the hardest course, the strongest course. Marrying you would be a failure, and I never fail. If you don't stop walking up and down, I'll scream. Come over here and kiss me. No. Don't you want to kiss me? Tonight I want you to love me calmly and coolly. The beginning of the end. Amory, you're young. I'm young. People excuse us now for our poses and vanities, for treating people like Sancho and yet getting away with it. They excuse us now, but you've got a lot of knocks coming to you. And you're afraid to take them with me. No, not that. There is a poem I read somewhere. You'll say Ella Wheeler Wilcox and laugh, but listen. For this is wisdom to love and live, to take what fate or the gods may give, to ask no question, to make no prayer, to kiss the lips and caress the hair, speed passion's ebb as we greet its flow, to have and to hold, and in time let go. But we haven't had. Amory, I'm yours, you know it. There have been times in the last month I'd have been completely yours if you'd said so. But I can't marry you and ruin both our lives. We've got to take our chance for happiness. Dawson says I'd learn to love him. Amory, with his head sunk in his hands, does not move. But life seems suddenly gone out of him. Lover, lover, I can't do without you. I can't imagine life without you. Rosalind, we're on each other's nerves. It's just that we're both high-strung and this week. His voice is curiously old. She crosses to him and, taking his face in her hands, kisses him. I can't, Amory. I can't be shut away from the trees and flowers. Cooped up in a little flat waiting for you? You'd hate me in a narrow atmosphere. I'd make you hate me. Again she is blinded by sudden, uncontrolled tears. Rosalind. Oh, darling, go. Don't make it any harder. I can't stand it. Do you know what you're saying? Do you mean forever? There's a difference somehow in the quality of their suffering. Can't you see? I'm afraid I can't if you love me. You're afraid of taking two years' knocks with me. I wouldn't be the Rosalind you love. I can't give you up. I can't, that's all. 
I've got to have you. You're being a baby now. I don't care. You're spoiling our lives. I'm doing the wise thing, the only thing. Are you going to marry Dawson Ryder? Oh, don't ask me. You know I'm old in some ways. In others, well, I'm just a little girl. I like sunshine and pretty things and cheerfulness. And I dread responsibility. I don't want to think about pots and kitchens and brooms. I want to worry whether my legs will get slick and brown when I swim in the summer. And you love me. That's just why it has to end. Drifting hurts too much. We can't have any more scenes like this. She draws his ring from her finger and hands it to him. Their eyes blend again with tears. Don't. Keep it, please. Don't break my heart. She presses the ring softly into his hand. You'd better go. Goodbye. She looks at him once more, with infinite longing, infinite sadness. Don't ever forget me, Amory. Goodbye. He goes to the door, fumbles for the knob, finds it. She sees him throw back his head, and he is gone. Gone. She half starts from the lounge and then sinks forward on her face into the pillows. Oh, God, I want to die. After a moment she rises, and her eyes closed, feels her way to the door. Then she turns and looks once more at the room. Here they had sat and dreamed. That trade she had so often filled with matches for him. That shade that they discreetly lowered one long Sunday afternoon. Misty eyes she stands and remembers. She speaks aloud. Oh, Amory! What have I done to you? And deep under the aching sadness that will pass in time, Rosalie feels that she has lost something. She knows not what. She knows not why. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part Three. Narration read by Anna Simo. Rosalind read by Claire Gauget. Amory read by James Rye. Mrs. Connage. Read by Kirsten Ferreri. Alec. Read by Jason Oakley.